storage vendors are trying to get down to like two copies of blocks, which really sucks for MapReduce because MapReduce, you want additional copies of blocks because each block goes onto a, a unique server and you want to be able to land node local map or reduce tasks on the server, right? So trying to keep these two things in balance can be tricky. Um, and then lastly, once you get these two sort of figured out as far as how they're performing together, um, you've now got to sort of figure out, well, where's Hadoop going to sort of sit on the slider so that it's like at a price point that you're willing to pay for? So this is kind of the funny thing, though. Like every customer I go to, I mean, it's, it's pretty common sense, but nobody's instrumented their, their cluster. So um, if I say to them, they say to me, you know, what you know, help us with our cluster design. And I say, well, are you I.O. bound or CPU bound or? There is a, a very simple method to quickly, uh, you know, figure out how, you know, how your cluster is affected. So uh, what you see over here are um, several of our Hadoop, several of the racks within our Hadoop cluster. And uh, what we do is every time we release a, um, a benchmark or a, a reference architecture, we will actually build it and run it. And uh, we typically run 10 terabytes to do terasorts as sort of a burning test to sort of um, capture um, metrics as to how different sets of hardware are performing for the deep. We'll use test DFS IO, grid links, and we've started to use high bench as well from Intel, which is quite nice because um, it actually ties use cases to performance data. So Highbench has um, uh, tests for like k-means clustering if you're doing machine learning, so graph processing algorithms, log processing, high queries, right? So you can just sort of run these on your cluster, create a baseline, and the next time you lose some hardware, you can run the same test and sort of see if you got the, 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 the order right. So the first step is basically uh, you want to instrument the cluster, then you run your workloads, you analyze the numbers, right? So it's common sense. But the, the funny thing is that a lot of people try and do paper exercises with Hadoop, and this is a bad idea. Every single time that we've posited how um, a typical outcome would come with it, just by figuring out a paper exercise, it's always been wrong. Hadoop surprises us every single time. So uh, don't do that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a 10 terabyte terasort on a full 42U rack. Okay, so the term U is a unit within a rack. A U in a rack is about that big, that high. It's a, it's a slot that you can slide a server tray into, right? There's 42 of these inside a rack. Um, I'll be using the term U quite a bit in here. So, and then just so that you can understand what, what goes into this test, uh, we have dedicated server, one for the job tracker, one for the name node, and, um, and then basically, um, each of those servers uh, has uh, 64 gig of RAM. Um, it's got dual six core Intel 2.9 gigahertz processors. It's got two controllers, and it's got 16 uh, small form factor midline SAS drives in there with four bonded one gigabit things. Now, if you look at this, this is an incredibly performance server design for uh, a worker node, but you remember the previous slide around the, the price curve, that's an expensive one too, right? So I'm gonna, I need to explain quickly what I'm trying to do here. So really where you want to be with um, server design, if you're going after purely performance with no consideration for price, you want to uh, make sure that you can keep the CPU as busy as possible without waiting on um, provi you know, data provisioning from any particular subsystem in the server, whether it's I.O., uh, or memory or network, okay? And so you want to make sure that there's no, no impedance from any of those in providing instructions to the CPU. And so what we've got here is 64 gig of RAM, lots of memory for a worker node. Uh, we've got the fastest uh, six core processors that Intel has. And then um, I've got two array controllers in here. Now this is why I have two here, right? Each array controller has four links Four cables, sorry, yeah, four cables that come off the controller, and within each cable are two SAS lanes. So basically, you have a dedicated SAS lane for every drive in a drive cage. So I can fully drive eight disks per uh, controller, 
without having to share any bandwidth between disks. Okay? Um, so if I have two controllers, I can fully drive 16 drives and there's no bandwidth sharing on any of the lanes, which gives me maximum throughput for my IO subsystem. I have uh, four bonded 1 dB nets, so you bond them to basically multiplex uh, you know, your, your uh, network transmit and receive, so that you're roughly getting four gigabits of throughput on the network. Right? Um, so, all right, so that's the basic um, setup here. So, then now, we, now, now that we've got the, the, the sort of rather performance service set up, now we're going to instrument the, the, the cluster. So the key here is just to capture the data. There's lots of different frameworks that you can use for instrumenting servers to capture utilization on them. Uh, in this case, Paul, my colleague, ran the test. He's been doing database performance testing for about 30 years, and he likes the Linux SAR tool, so that's what we use. Um, and so this is how we, we instrumented the cluster. We created one uh, sort of Uber script, and that script uh, sh shells into every single node in the cluster and starts uh, the Linux SAR process, okay? And that starts capturing system metrics. Then the outer script basically kicks off TerraSort and starts running, and then when TerraSort completes, uh, the script goes into each, each uh, particular node in the cluster, stops the SAR process, and then calls an ancillary script that basically takes the SAR.dat files from each server um, and it node one, so you'll run this one on one node and then you know, the second one you'll create a, a second node and then basically this all gets piped into the, into the database. And so that way, he, he, the, what, the, the reason he likes to do it in this manner is that he can basically do ad hoc analysis of all the performance data. So if you see something that's confusing him, he can basically ask him the questions he wants. So, now what I'm going to do is take you through the actual data from the TerraSort RAM and um, show you that the server design worked as intended. Uh, and so what you see on this chart here is on the x-axis, this is elapsed time. So every chart that I'm going to show you, I've got four charts, every chart that I'm going to show you, um, the x-axis is always elapsed time. Now, uh, on the y-axis, it's throughput, which is megabytes a second, okay? So the first thing you want to do is actually figure out the IO subsystem capability. So you run something called the DD test, which is able to quantify the read throughput and write throughput on a particular server, right? So this is what the server is capable of, right? Then you actually, using SAR, figure out how much Hadoop was able to drive out of that tape total throughput. So now, this chart is actually only halfway to the capability. It only goes up to 800 megabytes a second. But really, the previous slide, you know, the IO wait time was so low because the data was all in the page cache. Okay, so, and then lastly on the network subsystem, um, so what, if you remember, we bond all four NICs, so we have, uh, it's full duplex, so we have uh, 400, uh, 4 gigabytes a second read throughput, 4 gigabytes a second write throughput. And um, so that's basically roughly 400 megabytes a second. So on the, on the y-axis, we've got megabytes a second here. So 400 is the total capability. So we're really at like 20% on average of total network throughput. Now this should be interesting to you because there's a lot of people that are out there trying to sell you InfiniBand for Hadoop, right? Run your workloads and test this. You know, this is a one gigabit network, right? We're only at like 25% utilization. Now, TerraSort's not a particularly uh, network intensive workload. If you run TestDFSIO, it's very different because what TestDFSIO does is it basically creates uh, blocks, right? So it's writing to the distributed file system, generating blocks, and then those blocks then get replicated. So it keeps the network quite busy. So again, it's workload sensitive, but you know, this is a great, very simple way to see you know, for a given workload. So for our given workload, which is TerraSort, our network is 25% you know, utilized. Um, so effectively, what we've arrived at is a, a really good worker node design um, without any consideration for cost that's incredibly performant, right? And um, 
So now some, I want to digress a little bit on HBase. It works just fine for HBase as well. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we're able to uh, fully drive as much as we can the CPU. Um, we frankly ran out of driver nodes, so we were using the YCSB testing workload AMC. So let, I should back up and explain this quickly. So um, YCSB workload A basically is 50% read and 50% updates, random access to the database, and workload C is 100% read-only requests. Also, like, um, so I've got a Jira ticket here, um, and we're, we're working on it. That's why I said the results are still TBD, but uh, we found that basically when the data set for HBase is in the HBase cache, HBase screams. It's really fast. Um, but when that, when that data set is too big for the HBase cache, but is in, still can fit inside the Linux page cache in memory, there's a... Um, quite a significant latency increase between what you would see with just the, the HBase cache, which is in memory, versus just the Linux cache, which is in memory. So we're trying to figure out why that's happening. It's something to do with the way um, HBase is requesting the data. Um, it's not in the HBase cache, so it goes to HDFS to get the data, and HDFS is requesting it from Linux, and there's something in that basic handoff which is injecting some latency. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, Here's a ticket. I'm happy to talk to you offline about it if you're running into a simulation. So now we want to we've we've properly configured our our, our infrastructure. And now we want to tune this thing down for perform uh, for price, right? Something at a price point we're willing to to uh, that's palatable to us. So the first thing you should think about, and this isn't immediately obvious because you know. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about data centers until two years ago when I joined HP. So I was a Hadoop application developer and contributor, not a, a, a data center guy. So one of the really interesting things I, I learned about data centers is that basically, you know, they're designed around floor space, right? So tiles, right? And you can put, fit a rack on a tile. And uh, the data center ops team will tell you that they can, that they have given, depending on how much space they have, they only have so many tiles available, right? so many places for you to fit racks in. So that whichever data center your Hadoop cluster is in, they may only have space for like three racks, which greatly affects everything else because basically you can't scale Hadoop out. There's no space to scale it out, right? You have to find a whole nother data center if you want to just add nodes to improve your performance, right? So since you can't do that, you actually need to buy beefier nodes, right? Uh, so these are one of the practical issues. Um, the other is that the data center ops team will tell you that they can only supply a certain amount of power to a given rack. Um, and then this actually, you need to factor in when you're thinking of how many servers you're going to put into that rack, can you actually power them all? Or are you over-provisioning the power within the rack based on your server design? And I'll get into the um, intricacies of that in a minute. And then obviously there's the thermal dynamics, right? depending on how much power you're using in a rack, it generates a certain amount of heat, and you've got to be able to cool that in your data center, right? So that's another factor. So get that info first before you design your cluster because it'll affect everything else. Okay, so now um, on the disks, right? So basically there are only two types of uh, disks that I'd advocate for Hadoop, which is SATA, which is really low cost, um, large... Uh, uh, large storage capacity, and then there's midline SAS. So SATA is a three gigabyte per second protocol, and SAS is a six gigabyte per second protocol, so there's a throughput improvement on performance there. But the other factor is that, you know, midline SAS uh, is about 10,000 RPM for the spindles, whereas SATA is 7,000 to large form factor disks and small form factor disks. Um, this is important in... Um, improving I.O. performance. Uh, with MapReduce specifically, you've got a certain amount of slots per server. Uh, with this test, we used 18 maps and 12 reducers, right? So we had 30 slots configured per server. And um, what's, what happens is if you have too few drives, what, you get all these threads that are all just hitting one disk, right? And then basically you're getting I.O. queuing and interleaved I.O. that's occurring. And so it negatively affects your performance. So you want to have lots of disks to be able to 
disperse the I.O. out across all the different disks. So some people go to small form factor disks to do that. I, that's going to jack your, your cost up because they're quite a bit more expensive than, than large, form, uh, large form factor disks. So I'd actually advocate to drive cost down, get more large form factor disks than small form factor disks. The other thing I, to mention again is that the controllers. Um, again, your controllers will have a certain amount of links which have a certain amount of lanes. Um, and so you need to make sure that um, you know, if you want to try and save costs, you can go from two controllers down to one, or if you try to improve con performance, you can add an additional controller so that you improve bandwidth and thereby improve performance. Um, again, another thing on controllers, if, you know, if you're an enterprise guy versus a web guy, or you're a really, really large cluster guy or gal, um, you need to think about um, you know, whether you're going to use RAID or not. So, Typically, you know, I mentioned that earlier, and so this is why it's not crazy talk, right? If you have one or two racks and you're running them in production, you lose a couple of nodes, it's a big deal if your SLA is based around time to completion. We have a customer that can uh, quantify a loss of revenue for every minute their cluster is down, right? So um, what you want to do is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, one of those drives, and you can mirror them, and then you can still keep 12 drives available for uh, data, right? And so the way you set that up on a, on a RAID controller is each individual drive is its own RAID zero volume, okay? Now, I want to clarify, there is like something in Tom White's book about um, RAID, you know, Yahoo testing with RAID zero volumes. What that's talking about is taking all 12 drives and creating one single RAID zero volume, right? So what I'm talking about is create each one's its own RAID zero volume, it's effectively the same thing as JBoard, okay? So that's something that you could look at. Now, on the processor side, you have two, two Intel's basically got two sort of families. There's the socket R family, which is 130 watt processors as far as the power consumption. Um, but that's a 2.9 gigahertz processor because they have the power to, to drive that amount of performance. The socket B is a 95 watt processor. So there's lower power consumption, but it only goes up to 2.4 gigahertz. Um, but it's quite a significant power drop, right? So again, that's sort of one of the things you can look at if a customer tells you, uh, the ops team tells you they can't provide as much power to the rack as you'd need. Um, amounts of cores, you can drop down from 6 to 4. Dropping down will save you a little bit per processor. Uh, there's about, I think, about a $400 difference between the socket R and the socket B processors as well. Keep in mind you've got two of those per server. Um, and then also there's a difference in the amount of memory channels. So like the socket R processors will have four uh, memory channels and the socket B will only have three. So that's really, if you're using eight gigabyte DIMMs, that's the difference between 64 giga RAM per node or 48 giga RAM. You can use uh, four gigabyte DIMMs instead of eight gigabyte DIMMs and cut that in half if you don't need all that. Um, you can save, yeah, it's not a whole lot. I mean, that'll save. So what does this actually look like in a rack? Um, so if you look at the top there, you've got uh, two switches in the rack. Um, then you basically got you know the job tracker node and the, the name node in the rack. And we actually, I recommend to keep throwing in a third one because I like to put my Hadoop uh, clusters in a, in a private network so that uh, malicious users might kill other users' jobs and I can actually disaggregate the, the admin of the cluster from the users of the cluster. Um, and so I'll multi-home that management node from the user network to the Hadoop fiber network. And, um, and then basically, you know, the two U uh, worker nodes have to populate the rest of the rack, having a minimum of three uh, nodes up to 18. So once you have this, this is like a building, an initial building block, right? You've got your management service here, your master service here. And uh, you know, you've got a certain measure of, of worker nodes in here. Um, but if you want to scale this out, you, when it's set up this way, you don't actually need to change it if you want to scale up, right? So this single rack is the initial building block you just saw in the previous slide. And then to scale this up, you just add more of this particular rack design, right? So again, it's the two bonded top, top rack switches. If your cluster is big enough, you don't put two in there, you don't, you don't, maybe you don't need your rack or You just populate the rest of the rack with you know, your Hadoop slaves. And then at an aggregation level, uh, you want to connect the top of rack switches to at least the 10 gigabits Ethernet uh, aggregation switch. 
And one of the points about switching is that um, uh, I recommend that you get switches with deep packet buffers so that this would be kind of a bursty uh, framework where you know, the network's fairly silent while the maps are working. But then when the kind of shuffle and sort comes, there's an uptick in the amount of traffic that gets sent between the routes. So, um, and if that's occurring at the same time as like ingestion, um, so you're popping data into your cluster, your switches can get pretty busy. So you don't want them to drop packets. So deep buffering helps somewhat with that. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about system on a chip. Um, to me, this seems a little bit like um, it's all for our community for and I think it should be on. Uh, Al Zeta, uh, uh, service here, server cartridges. Cal Zeta is just one of the different vendors that are taking um, uh, ARM servers and uh, ARM, ARM processors and turning them into servers. So I just think it should be on our radar. If you're interested in the space, Trevor Robinson uh, from Cal Zeta is actively working on this. Um, it's kind of a tricky spot to work in right now because in the Hadoop community, nobody really, from like the code contribution standpoint, doesn't seem like anybody really cares that much about memory management because we can over provision it so much in our, our servers. We'll have like 48, 64 gig of RAM, you know. So people aren't like being like super picky about managing, you know, memory. Whereas if you've got four gig of RAM total for your server that you've got to carve up between all your map and reduce lots, you need to uh, manage it pretty carefully. So Trev is trying to put in all these like little memory management patches inside Hadoop and uh, you know he, he gets a bit frustrated sometimes where someone will come in and you know add a bunch of code that you know changes his code and just like totally ups the memory utilization. So but anyways I just think this is something that you should be thinking about. Um, you know this is I think disrupting scale out computing in the same way that Hadoop is disrupting scale out data management a little bit. So that is it. Um, thanks, I appreciate you listening to my talk. And uh, are there any questions? Yes, please. And how much storage is it? So, um, oh, sorry, I can not So, um, on the, um, the ARM cartridges, they're configurable. So, basically, um, there's a number of different cartridge designs. Um, and what you typically see is on this tray here, so if I can, oops. So it's, you know, you can sort of partition this tray into three quadrants, okay? And typically, um, what you have is um, the, the first and third quadrant would just be the server cartridges, and each server cartridge has like one terabyte small form factor drive on it. And in the middle row, what you have is a, uh, a storage cartridge, and the server cartridges have like SAS expanders on them that can connect to the storage cartridge. And so like a storage cartridge will have like two disks on it, for example. And so um, if it'll share disk one with a server in this row and disk two with the server in that row. So, you know, like right, I think we'll probably be coming out of the gates, you know, there, there'll probably be a, a, a two terabyte uh, for so the two two terabytes with two disks with with uh, four cores with eight gig of RAM or something like that. Sorry, a shared point of failure. So with the um, the storage cartridge being a, a single point of failure, like that row. No, because if that went offline, you'd still have the disks on. Uh, you'd still have um, the disk that's actually on the stored server cartridge. You just lose that. It'd be like losing a disk in a standard um, cluster. But it, it, this is like a pretty amazing.